So, uh, welcome to Bible study tonight. Uh, this is a little new for me, so bear with me. Uh, hopefully this won't be too painful for everybody. Uh, it might be painful for me, though, so we'll see. Uh, before we get started, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, God and our plans. Uh, there's some material in the back. Uh, if you haven't gotten it yet, and there should be material for next week, I actually didn't check before I went. But, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about God and our plans, and uh, before we get started, we'll get a word of prayer. <clears throat> Let's pray. Dear God, we come to you now humbly, thanking you for this time that we have to uh, gather together as Christians and learn more about your word. We pray that as we go through this study that uh, we learn more about your will and, and what you have um, in your plan for us and that uh, when we go through our lives that we we go through constantly thinking about um, your will in our lives and what, what, how we should plan uh, in accordance to that. Uh, be with us that uh, everything that we say and do here will be in accordance to your will and uh, help us uh, gather at the next time. Pray this all in your son's name. Amen. All right, so uh, hopefully you guys uh, read the, the verses for tonight, but uh, we're going to go ahead and, and just reread them to set the, set the tone. Uh, get them fresh in our brain. So, uh, James chapter 4, uh, verse 13 through 17 are the, uh, the verses for tonight. Uh, verse 13 says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him is sin. I missed that one already. All right, so we're going to go right into the questions here. Um, focusing on verse uh, 13, we... Um, we see James warning about this mentality um, to just go out and and plan ahead uh, with this with specific mentality that this person had. Um, what do we see in James four as the question says in James four and four um, that was uh, so was symptomatic of what we see in James thirteen. Do you want to have that? James talks about having friendship with the world, right? So instead of concern uh, for things that are eternal, you know, and when we look at that uh, 4.13 through the lens of 4.4, we see that, you know, here are people that are not concerned about their eternal destination. They're concerned about, hey, let's let's do this. Let's make money. They're, they're very focused on being uh, friends. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, we see in verse 4 that they're, they're calling them adulterers and adulteresses because they're putting the things of the world ahead of the, um, the godly things. And so their focus was purely, um, purely on the world, not on God. So that was essentially committing adultery. Um, and we'll get a little bit more into that later um, when uh, Jesus actually refers to that as well. Does anyone else have any comments on that before I keep moving? So then, in uh, the, the next question, we got, um, this goes fast. What was the main uh, goal of those who were making, and we kind of touched on this already, but uh, what was the main goal of those who were making plans, and what insight does Jesus give, um, which may help us understand this concern uh, that James is having here. So uh, we'll go ahead and just read real quick. Um, I thought Mark 8, uh, 36 was also a good uh, verse for this. It says, uh, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes uh, in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. So we also we touch on this uh, adulterous uh, mentality again that was um, talked about in James 4. Uh, in verse 4, that leads to this idea of um, making plans with the main focus on um, yourself rather than God. So, um, 
So what else uh, can we kind of glean from this? Anyone else have any comments on this? Go ahead, Shane. Well, there 13 is talking about making plans to go do business elsewhere. So I guess the emphasis is on the business and not on God, obviously. But, but not, not even just on yourself, but on, on making money and putting that before God. Yeah. It seems like maybe these folks, you know, aren't believers. I mean, you know, he's, he's addressing believers through this entire letter. We've established that before. But, you know, James is trying to have them think about, if, if we read a little bit further on, putting it through the lens of, you know, what is your life? Mm-hmm. You know, you, you're so concerned with trading and making a profit, you know, but you're forgetting to ask for what the Lord wills. Yep. Right? At, at, at the end of the day, you know, it's one of these things where <laughs> the very air we breathe could be taken away. You know, there's so many things we take for granted that, that allows us to continue to sustain our lives. And so it, it almost seems like when I read this, you know, that James is, is doing what Jesus would do and he would he would kind of set up an argument uh, as an extreme example or as a caricature. But it seems like these folks, you know, that, that James is always referencing here, they're not believers, that they're not Christians. They're just people that are concerned about, hey, let's, let's go where the wind may blow us and let's go here and make money. Yeah. You know? And it's it's interesting too that you say that, right? The, um, you know, what is this money and this, these the focus of these people? Is that is that really worth anything? Because um, that's what Jesus is talking about uh, in in verse thirty six, right? What will it profit a man if he gains everything, the whole world, but loses his soul, right? This this physical um, idea that these guys are are um, focused on isn't going to profit much. Um, also, uh, another verse that I thought of was uh, I thought of while reading this was First uh, John uh, two and seventeen, and that whole idea that uh, the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So this will lead into some of the stuff that we talk about later um, in this this lesson. But the whole idea is that you know once again. Um, in, in verse 13, that they're focusing uh, purely on what am I going to do, this physical world, um, with no, no regard for the will of God that lasts forever. Um, any other comments on that question before we move on? Okay. Uh, so the next, the next uh, question was about, uh, so these people in, in verse 13 were thinking about next year, but uh, James says you don't even know about tomorrow. So um, this refers also to Luke uh, 2 and 18 uh, and verse 18 through 21 um, of the, the farmer that was a, that was a fool. So um, you know what you know what were the things that um, this mentality that J- that James was talking about in verse 13 and the uh, the farmer in, in Luke 12. You know what were some uh, mentalities of that person that. Um, that was uh, being called out here. That, that was not the, the way to do things. Did anyone have any ideas on that? Yeah, uh, the thing of it is, is they. This is what we're going to do. We're going to tie. We're going to do this tie, and you're going to plan it for a year and everything. And God's out of the equation. They, they believe God knows you how to. Every all all that you're going to do is themselves, and yep. you should be looking for towards God because you have no guarantee of the mm-hmm. Anything? Go ahead, Mary. Are you seeing that contrast between what's valuable and what's uh, vain? Just vanity. And, uh, the Ecclesiastes, whenever the word vanity is used, it means vapor. It's the same word, the terminology that James uses. And uh, it talks a lot about the vanity of pursuing things on this earth, knowing that somebody's going to end up with them no matter how great or small you end up with or rust will get to them, that it's all really, it doesn't matter. So you need to pay attention to the contrast, what is truly valuable. Yep. Any other comments? So I also had to that, um, you know, Jesus straight up calls him a fool, right, for this, this, uh, this idea. So he had, um, because of this, uh, several, um, I would say, character attributes of this person, uh, this kind of, Compiled into this um, his false mentality. So I mean, the first one, he was a fool. Uh, Jesus calls him a fool, and he essentially took for granted what he had, and that his time and all of these things that he he built up for himself, right? So he he uh, said he store up all these these goods, and he would be good forever, right? And 
the whole time, right, he had that mentality, I, I did this, I built up this, and I think someone over there is commenting on this, right? I did this, I built up everything, and I'm good, I'm set. Um, but he was a fool because all those things that he built up, one, he had to focus those things on the, uh, the physical things rather than the spiritual, right? But um, he also had that mentality of not having God in his plans. It was all about me, about I, and it wasn't going to go... Um, go that way, as, uh, as God says in the next few verses. So any more uh, thoughts on that? Alright, so then uh, the next, the next uh, question, we, it's talking, it pulls up several uh, different verses here. We don't have to go through every single verse, but uh, maybe if uh, some people can just kind of comment on what each verse is talking about, about the uh, brevity of life. So, um, you know, James in, in uh, verse 14 is saying that our, our life is like a vapor, right? And uh, so then uh, we see here in our in our content here that uh, several verses that are talking like what our life is akin to in terms of vapor. Um, so kind of like Merritt was talking about vanity. Um, that one wasn't specifically uh, talked about here. But uh, so Job uh, 7 and 6. Uh, anyone want to talk about that one? That one was a kind of a tough one if you didn't know anything about weaving. So, uh, I'll go ahead and take that one. Uh, Job 7 and 6 is talking about uh, throwing a shuttle. Um, so, if you're uh, a weaver, which I'm not, and I didn't know a thing about it until this, um, there's a shuttle that goes back and forth that the, uh, the person who's uh, making the, uh, the quilt or whatever it is, they'll, they have to shove that thing back and forth really quickly, and it goes back and forth. And I'm sure there's probably an automated version of it now that probably goes faster. And the idea is our life is like the shuttle that just goes back and forth, it's super quick, and it has a thread in it that gets, um, gets used up, and it, and it disappears quickly. Um, so our lives are like, like that shuttle. Uh, Job 8 and verse 9. Anyone know what Job 8 and 9 is talking about? So we'll go ahead and read that. Um, the first good is the shadow. Yeah, shadow, right? It's there from Loma Jerry, you know, Sunshine, you shower there. Yep. And pretty soon it can be leaked. That's it. Yep. At that quick before. Yeah, and it also talks about, so it talks about a shadow, and like you said, you know, a cloud can pass over, that shadow is gone. Or uh, if you, like an old sundial, that, that shadow moves and it's gone at night. Um, also, it talks about being born yesterday, right? We, it's just like we were just here, and then we'll be gone. Uh, Job 9.25. Uh, it talks about being um, swifter than a runner. So as a runner myself, uh, I'm not very swift, but um, the idea that it's, you know, it's a quick thing that goes by. But the one thing I did think about on the swifter than a runner idea is, and this happens with a lot of things in life, um, if you're, so if I'm preparing for a big event that, that takes a long time, so a uh, half Iron Man might take me seven hours, and you're, you're prepping for that and you're dreading that moment and you're thinking, well, when I start doing that, I'm not necessarily dreading, but when you start doing it, you're like, I don't know if I'm going to make it through that seven hours and it seems like it's such a long time to get through that. And you might be going through it and it's going, it's going, and by the time you get to the end of it and you look back on it, it went like back like that, like it was nothing, right? And so this is kind of the idea in Job uh, 9.25 and a lot of these verses is you, once you look back on it, it went by really quickly. Um, I know, too, that looking back on, I, I just remember like it was yesterday when we first moved up here 20-some years ago, and going from our house to church was only like 20 minutes, but it felt like forever. Um, but looking back on it, it's just, it's just instant. Uh, next one be in the same uh, chapter, uh, Job 9 and 26. It's talking about uh, swift ships and uh, eagle swooping, right? So very, very fast things. Um, we can just kind of gloss over these two, um, unless someone has any uh, real good insight on these. And then Job 14, uh, in verse 1 and 2, and also Psalms 9 and 90 in verse 12, actually kind of go uh, hand in hand. And we'll go ahead and read um, Psalm 90. <coughs> so Psalm 90 says, in verse 12, uh, so teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. 
So this idea in Job 14, 1 and 2 and Psalm 90 is our, our days are numbered. We only have a certain amount of days. We don't really know how long those days are going to be, um, but they're going to be over pretty quick. Um, Job also 14 talks about how you know, our days are full of trouble. Some of the trouble we cause because we have this wrong mentality um, that we talked about in, in the first couple of questions here. And then um, it also compares us to a flower, right? So a lot of you guys are probably planting your flowers for the year or have already planted them, and they're blooming right now, but give it a few more months and they're going to be dead, and you're going to either have to replant them or wait another uh, few months so they, they rebloom for the next year, right? All right, any more comments on the question four? Okay. That last one made me think of Ecclesiastes 12, the first part, verses 1 through 8, which I think we're all quite familiar with. It gives us a perspective on life in general. Mm-hmm. All right, so next uh, we'll go to, to question five. So how does... Uh, James label these plans um, in James 4 uh, and verse 16. So, uh, so we talked about this idea that this guy's like, hey, I'm going to go and do such and such thing and um, make all this money. So what does James say about that? So they're boasting in arrogance and that it's evil. Yep. And um, the interesting thing about that too is um, so obviously, you know, boasting and arrogance is not a good thing, and it's straight up called evil um, by James here. Um, but the idea is right. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You're boasting in that, but um, who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? And then you might have had this too, you know, in work or in your day-to-day life. Um, someone is boasting about something, and you know the right thing, um, the right answer, or you know what that person actually did, but they're boasting and saying, oh, I did this, or I know this is going to happen. And, you know, in your head you're like, no, that's not, that's not how it went down, or that's not what actually happened. And in a way, that's kind of like what we are when we, when we make plans and think that uh, everything that we do and we say is going to happen. God's like, well, it might not. It's up to me, right? It's up to God's will, not, not our, our will. Um, any, more, uh, any more thoughts on that? Good. Yeah, when you think about that and what he says there in that whole section, you know, he's subtly contrasting, I think, God's sovereignty versus, you know, our whimsical nature. We, we think we're gonna we're gonna make these plans. This is what we're gonna do today, tomorrow, and then the next day. But look how fast our life goes, and how in reality, how insignificant it is compared to the sovereignty of God, and that He actually does control everything. That's why he says there. You need to see God's will in what you're doing, so that the time that you have here is effective, and you don't you're not boasting, trying to boast in areas. God is the one who's in control. Again, this this is sort of a caricature, and sometimes it's we we look at it from afar, and we don't think about you know necessarily uh, applications to our own life. You know, I remember I was in the service and got hurt, and I knew that my time was up. Right, I knew I wasn't going to be able to continue in the service. But I fought, and I held on to that, and I tried, and I tried, and I tried to... You know, because that was my plan. I was going to do 20 years. I was going to retire from the service. I was you know, going to be 48 years old, and I was going to be done, done with the service 30 years. Not, not 30 years. <laughs> but, you know, be done, right? And that's, that was my plan. And, and you know, even, though I was, even though I was hurt, even though I was unable to continue to do this, you know, that's, what I, that's what I wanted to do. And... Um, you know, I remember very distinctly when you know the reality of it hit me that I was no longer going to be able to continue. And I just prayed. I was like, God, I said, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, that this was my life, this was my plan, this was my career, and this is what I did. Send me where you need me to go. Right? Just with whatever that, whatever plans you have for me, wherever it is that you think. You know, I had job offers all over the United States and. You know, I, I just I just think we remember, you know, God, I don't know what to do. You know, this this is this is starting over. You know, I've spent all this time and this energy and this effort. And, you know, I, I think when we, we try to bring that back into a personal perspective and we think about, you know, times when we've had these these things, and not necessarily something as as grand as well, I'm gonna to go to this town and make all this money, but 
I mean, how many college students, you know, well, I'm going to go and get a bachelor's degree in, in whatever, and, you know, I'm going to go and, and be the CEO of a major corporation. And then life happens, and you realize, like, oh, I didn't finish college, <laughs> and now I'm straddled with all this debt. And, you know, it, it's just one of those things where when, when we, we sit there and we think about what our plans may be, right, and, and how we can fall into those traps so easily, right? I'm going to chase this promotion. I'm going to, you know, this this new zip code that I want to move into, the schools are going to be great for my kids and everything's going to be amazing and you get there and because you don't, you're not looking at it through the lens of, uh, as Craig said, you know, what God wants for you. You know, yeah, maybe the zip code's great but the closest church is an hour and a half away. You know, and, and so you're not thinking about things properly and then all of those carefully laid plans of men just start to, to unleash. Yeah, it's funny too that you mentioned college and all that and uh, Craig was talking about being whimsical and going about our own business. I, I remember when I was in college, I switched majors, I think, at least three times and then quit for a while and then went back. So our uh, our earthly uh, plans are quickly changing um, and we see, by contrast, as we've been talking, uh, God's will is, is constant. All right, so now we're going to get what I think uh, to be more into the, the meat of the lesson. Uh, so uh, question six says, um, and this is a loaded multiple question thing, so we can kind of break this down. Um, so I would just kind of maybe stick to the, the first thing. We've already kind of touched on uh, on the first part, what, what kind of plans do we make in life, right? So we talked about college or our career path, things like that. Um, um, so you know, kind of taking that in mind and taking what um, James uh, 4 and 13, you know, is it wrong to make plans and, you know, what does the Bible have to say about that? The first part is, I, it's so easy for me always to forget that part of the Lord wills. I think it's okay to make plans, but if you have a caveat in your brain at all times, that it's not, it's not in my hands all the time. So if the Lord wills, I'm going to do this. Lord will do that, but that's the hard part for me is always keeping that in mind. Um, yeah, I, I'll paraphrase. I'll paraphrase Craig. You know, but uh, Craig recently had a set of lessons that I've heard him say before about taking the long view towards something. Um, you know, I've, I've got young daughters that are becoming teenagers, and you know, are, are starting to ask questions and, and show interest in, in men. Much to my chagrin, um, but I, I start to talk to them about, you know, if 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 and when you start dating, this isn't a, a done conclusion, but if and when you start dating, if you, you, you want to right, you want to date with marriage in mind, you know, you, you don't just want to say, well, you know, this is what everybody else is doing, you know, so I want to do it. I mean, you want to get to know who that person is, you want to know where they're at spiritually, you want to know. Uh, you know, what type, sort of discipline they have, what their beliefs are, all, all of these things that you need to know that, you know, as, as an ignorant young teenager, I didn't take into consideration. Um, you know, and, and the same thing, you look at it and, and you, you start to, to make all these considerations. And it, it was interesting because somebody recently on Facebook had said, hey, my son's considering this college. What do you think? And a bunch of people were like, oh, that's a great college, top-notch college, you know, great place, great place. And then somebody chimed in and said, well, the closest church is 45 minutes away. And they're like, you know, as a college student, they may or may not have the end. And it was like, I remember reading that particular comment. And, you know, I was just more of an observer and reading through. And just things snapping into a different perspective for me. Like, oh, you know what? Yeah, this is, this is something college kids really need. You know, this is something that, that is, a, is a perspective that, I, you know, we, we definitely need more of this. How close is it? You know, it doesn't matter if you're going somewhere and making a lot of money, it doesn't matter if you're, you're being successful from an earthly perspective. If you, I, I know, because I've been there, done that, if you don't have you know, strong, grounded brothers and sisters around you, you know, try finding a church in Afghanistan, good luck. And it's, um, you, know, you think you're doing the right thing, but then you realize like there's no one around me that I can fellowship with, and just how hard and stressful that is. So yeah, I, I, I think one of the things, when we're looking at making plans, that we, we have to really consider you know, where we are. We can't all be Paul and just 
you know, go into a place and make a church. So, yeah. <laughs> he seems pretty challenging with that. So it's interesting that you, yeah, bring that up. Um, it kind of goes with also what was talked about over here. It was that, um, so talking about plans and any verses on that, right? The, if we can kind of go the, the obvious route or the, uh, the necessary inference route right off the bat is Paul, right? He had to plan, you would think, to make journey, all the journeys that he did to, to preach, right? Uh, Craig, did you have something? Well, yeah, I don't think Trump make plans. God makes plans. Uh, Jeremiah 29 11, God says, He talks about that I have a plan for you, not just people, uh, for their benefit and not for evil, that He wants their good. So, if we're following His example, yeah, it's fine to make plans. It's, uh, but are, how are our plans God centered or are they, you know, just too mystic in nature? Yep. So, go ahead. Yeah, you know, uh, there's an old saying that's been around for a long time. Plan. I mean, we plan for a lot of different things. We plan for our retirement and various things. And that's fine. But, it, but then the latter part of that is live every day like we want to die tomorrow. Be prepared. Yep. Good. Uh, I was just thinking, several times in my life I've had something happen and something good going on, and I'll start to think, I'll start to think good things about that. And oftentimes the, the parable of Luke 12 will come to my mind about the rich man building the barns and how foolish he was in assuming, you know, that that would continue to be that way, and that he was putting his faith in himself versus God. And that's the message that plays in my mind when I start to have those kinds of feelings: is that I'm putting faith in myself, not in God. And I think that's where the making plans part. Yep, exactly. Um, so. One of the things that came up to mind, other than uh, Paul, obviously had to make plans, and and the point of his plans was generally God's will, right? He he needed to get around, preach the word, um, so that kind of plays into this idea, right? What what's God's will? Um, another one that, that kind of came up to my mind was uh, some parables um, in Matthew 25. So we have two parables here that I thought were um, pertinent to this, and we're not going to go through and read all of it for the sake of time. But the first one is we had the, the one about the ten virgins, right? And kind of the bridge version of this was uh, five of them um, were wise and five were foolish. The five that were wise, they, they planned ahead, right? They, they got their oil, they had it ready, and as a result, they were found favorable and allowed into the... Um, into the, the wedding when the other guys were off running off to try to find oil. And so this idea, right, that they, they planned ahead and they were rewarded for it. And the reason why, right, is they had the right, the right mentality when they were playing in the head. They, they were trying to um, get into this, this uh, wedding, which is an obvious parallel to our spiritual lives. And um, the other one, too, on that note was the, the parable of the talents. So, once again, the bridge version of that is in uh, Matthew 25 and 14. Um, you know, uh, this master gave uh, the uh, three servants, he gave one, one talent, right? Um, another one, uh, three or two, and then the other one, uh, five. And uh, the idea is two of them, they planned ahead, right? And they, they, made, they doubled what they had. Because um, the idea, right, is they wanted to please their master, um, the the first guy, he 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 actually did plan ahead, but he wasn't planning correctly, right? He he was more um, he was more concerned for himself because he didn't want to lose that that one talent, and so he had the wrong plans in mind. He didn't have that focus on, hey, I know my master would want me to do something with this talent rather than just kind of bury it in the sand and wait for him to come back. And we obviously see what happened as a result. So that the, uh, the, the guys who did something with their talents, they planned ahead properly, they got rewarded. And the guy who didn't um, got punished for that. So, you know, this whole idea, and I think a lot of people touched on it, is that, you know, our plans have to have God's will in mind. And that's, that's what makes it uh, okay, right? That it's, it's not wrong to make plans as long as we are have that mindset that, you know, if God, when we get into, I'm going to spoil the next one, um, so we'll go ahead and go in there. Um, but the idea is that we're having God's will in mind. So, and verse, or the next, next question, um, so what should the guiding principle uh, be behind plans we make? And that's directly said in James uh, 4.15. It's the Lord's will. Yep, Lord's will. 
Um, so the, the whole idea, right, is we're just keeping God the focus of our plans. And in Matthew, we see that, um, obviously, in Paul and his journeys, his plans that he made, um, everything was the, the focus of, uh, was God, God focused. Um, so then question eight. Uh, so consider, the, think of the word, uh, the term will. Um, what was the will of Jesus in John uh, 4.34? And what did Paul consider um, as he looked ahead to the future? And there's several uh, verses here listed as well. So hopefully some of you guys read this already. I don't know the answers. So what was Jesus as well when he's uh, in John 4.34? He did the Father. Yeah, the will of the Father, right? And so our will should be, you know, we're supposed to be Christ-like, right? So we also want to have... Um, uh, our will to be the will of the Father. And that actually kind of goes in with the, the Sunday class that we had about, um, or we've been having about um, self-denial, right? We remove our will, and we make our will God's will. Um, and then what, what about Paul? Like when he was making all these plans, and we see in Romans and, and 1 Corinthians, what was the idea behind Paul, too? One thing, I don't know the scriptures or not, but um, Paul always made sure he would at a church, close to a church where he could assemble on uh, first day of the week. Yeah. Did someone? In, in, in Romans 1 10, he says that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. So he was putting God's will just like James told us to do. Yep. And whenever. Go ahead. Um, so we're looking at plans for the future and looking at you know, making sure our wills are good for the plans for the future. What Paul's also done here in these scriptures and in many other, he always takes a look back and says all this stuff wasn't necessarily me that willed it and planned it. By the, he says, by the grace of God, uh, it is God's will for me to do this uh, by the power of God. It's all God. So if that's in the testament to what his view is of the present and the future, then that means he's given all God to whatever God will both. Whether, whether whether it be in the future or in the past, and to kind of go off that too, right? He he had plans to go wherever wherever it was. He always said, you know, if it's if it's God's will. But um, we know he was shipwrecked, right? So that that probably went against his plans, I would think. Um, he had the vision where he was told to to go a different route, right? So all these different things that kind of adjusted where he's going. Did we have another? Yeah. Just I think it, sometimes it's easy to talk about God's will and then we, want, we want to use that and we want to make sure that's what we're planning for. But I always, it's always, it's always helpful for me to step back and be practical about it because sometimes those things take a long time to plan. So when you think about that, for instance, you know, somebody made a comment, you know, it's not wrong to make plans and really good plans. I agree. If you're going to plan for we might think about, well, I'm going to plan for retirement. I'm going to make sure I'm well taken care of, my family's taken care of. Um, and those are good things, but when you're thinking that far down the line, for instance, are you thinking about, okay, well, how how am I gonna, how much money am I going to set aside to be able to, you know, when I'm freed up from work, spend some extra time visiting people or evangelizing or helping people, or you're thinking about kids, you know, we often think about, well, I want to give my kids a lot as many opportunities as I can. They'll be a great sports player, a great or a great academic student. And, I want to make sure that you get into the best college, but you know, planning for God's will means maybe I need to, to make sure that you know they're going to be able to be active in church. Um, you know, that they're set up to, to either you know marry a husband who's going to be an elder, uh, or you know, if they're you know a young man that they're they consider preaching and evangelizing. And so things like that take a longer time or they take more time you can't just decide um, as many probably can speak to when, you know, when they're 16 hey this is what I want you to do it's too late then. <laughs> so thinking about God's will and thinking for God's will you know, what does that really mean I guess is something to think about yeah so I mean I, I would kind of build off that too right when you're at work I mean you probably th- Unfortunately, a lot of us probably think about work and all that more than what we should think about God. And if you're at work and you're maybe you got a new job and you're trying to save up, right? You put a little bit in. You're, when you're planning ahead for retirement or something, right? You're 
putting in money every week to your 401k or you're um, putting money into your company stock or you're doing this, that, or the other every day and you're doing that years ahead in advance. Well, I mean, just like that with, with our kind of physical lives, right? We need to do that spiritually, right? We plan ahead like, hey, my end goal is, um, is heaven, right? My end goal is to be God-like, to... Um, you know, that's, a, that's kind of our, our spiritual retirement, so to speak. And so just like our 401k gets deposited every day, or, or not every day, but every paycheck, and we do all these things that invest long term, maybe we put money into our kids' accounts or, or for college or whatever it is, we also need to plan ahead spiritually, right? We're trying to plan for our spiritual uh, retirement, so to speak, which is uh, years in advance, hopefully. Um, so, and the idea with kids too, right? When we, we have kids, we try to um, invest in them early spiritually. Uh, any more comments on this? Go ahead. Well, just to piggyback off of what's being said, um, in Luke chapter 14, Jesus says to count the cost of discipleship. And he's making it clear that that's the first and foremost planning and cost that should be counted, not, you know, how much should go in my 401k. Uh, how many hours do I need to work to do that at the expense of my discipleship? It's count the cost of discipleship, and your will around that will, will come afterwards. Seth, you have Go back to Craig's point, the, the foolish man you talked about earlier, he had basically two plans. The first plan was to work really hard and store up his grain and, and have everything he needed. But nowhere in that part did he say, I want to fellowship with my brother and I'm going to, mm-hmm. to, to study God's uh, word and things like that. The second part was, I'm going to relax. And so nowhere in that part after he could quit working was there, I'm going to use my time after I'm done working as, a, as an employee somewhere to go ahead and go help with fellowship and things like that there either. So that's why he's cool. Yep. Okay, anyone else? All right. Um, so uh, the next the next question. Uh, so what do the the following scriptures urge us to do with reference to God's will for our lives? Um, so we have Acts 22, Ephesians 5, and Romans uh, 12 and Ephesians 6. So um, I think these are probably put in this order for a specific reason. But um, so what does uh, Acts 22 say about um, God's will? So the first step, and this kind of goes in, it, it kind of reminds me of uh, the, the steps of salvation or something. Um, you, you would typically like say, okay, you need to do these certain things to be, to be saved. And so in Acts chapter 22, the idea is to, to know his will, right? First we have to know it. Um, so, and how do, we, how do we know God's will? Like what's the, the way that we do that? How do we accomplish knowing his will? So we're given the Bible, right? And that's His will. So the next, the next step in that. Um, so if we're, we're to know His will, and we're so we're studying. So what's the the purpose of us studying and reading His will? To show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing. Yeah. So rightly dividing is the the key word that I was looking for. There is is another word for that is understand, right? To understand His will. Um, so then the, the next part of that, so once you know his will and you are conformed to his will, or oh, I just gave it away, you understand his will, then what's the next thing you have to do? You have to conform, right? So, um, so you, you figure out what the will is, you understand what it is, and then you conform to it. And what's the, the final thing that it talks about here? Yeah, so you do it, right? So you know, you know all these things, you're studying, and because you studied, because you've done all this, you, you can then uh, do his will. And that, that just kind of reminds me of, of kind of like growing up, you always had the steps of salvation, right? You've got to hear the word, you got to know it, and then you've got to you know, act on it type of thing. Um, uh, any more thoughts on the will? Go ahead, Jake. I'm going to read Romans 12, 2 verses real quick. Yeah. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is that which is the good and acceptable and perfect. So it seems like we're supposed to be transforming our minds, yes, to by, by the will of God, but what the focus is, what, what the end game is with it is so that we can prove what the will of God is. So, I mean, that's, that, that obviously means a little bit more than just 
just conforming to it, because then he would have just said, just be transformed by the renewing of your minds to God's will. But he didn't. He said, be transformed so that you may prove what God's will is, which is perfect. So that, even that is more, uh, I guess, incentive to, to be conformed and to be transformed. And there's even more to that, too, right? Because you... So you're knowing His will, you're understanding it, so now you're, you're conforming so that you can prove it, which then means that you can spread His will elsewhere, right? So you're proving it to other people um, so that they can know it, they can understand it, they can conform and, and do His will. Um, any more comments? All right. So then our final, uh, final countdown here. Uh, question 10. So if we know uh, God wills us for, to do something, but we choose not to do it, um, what does it become? So James 4, 17 is the, the easy answer there. So what happens when we know we're supposed to do something, but we don't do it? What, what's that called, typically? Yes, yeah, a sin, right? And so specifically they're calling it a, a sin of omission, right? So can we, uh, does have, anyone have any like examples of uh, times in the in the Bible where someone's committed a, a sin of omission. So you know we go back to Cain and Abel, right? Where Cain brought a sacrifice, it wasn't what God wanted, you know. And, and so God said, "I'm not pleased with this." You, you're you're trying very hard to just check a box. You're trying very hard to to do the bare minimum, but this is this is not what I ask. So. Um, I think Van Ness and Fire, yes, they were dishonest, yep. but they also, they were told to just do a specific thing, and that's what the, obviously in the context, that was the assumption that that's what was going on, but they instead did not really that. They did, they did something other than that, and so they, they knew what was supposed to be done, but they didn't do it, and, then, and so... It's, I don't think it's necessarily wrong just in and of itself we didn't do it. It's the reason and it's the implication. It's what happens after, since you didn't do what mm-hmm. you knew was supposed to be done. Yep. Now, on that note, too, um, the idea, one that I thought of was a little more egregious than just simply omitting, but Jonah, right? He was told to go, go preach somewhere and he decided not to do that. And I thought that was somewhat applicable to us and that, you know, how many times do we think that maybe someone wouldn't accept the gospel or maybe we just don't like them enough to, to you know, so we think that, oh, we don't, we don't want to really talk to them. Um, so Jonah, you know, God was told him he knew he was supposed to go somewhere and he decides to go the other way. Um, anyone else had any ones? Go ahead, Greg. Saul was supposed to destroy the Amalekites and instead he decided to do his version of it. Another another example, uh, the Good Samaritan, right? Uh, Luke Luke 10, verse 30, 37, where that parables, uh, or the parables taught, um, you know, we had all these, uh, the people that were, that should have known, should have helped out this person, and then, um, so they, they had a sin of omission, right? They, they should have um, helped out, uh, helped out the, uh, the injured person, but instead um, it ended up that the Samaritan uh, showed up, helped. Um, anyone have any other ones? In Matthew 25, you have the king on Judgment Day coming and saying, um, you know, I was hungry and didn't feed me. And so there's a sin of a mission there with those people who didn't, didn't respond to the person in need. Yep. So I think to kind of pull it all together, right, so we're, we're talking about God's will here. Um, the, the idea is that, um, you know, when we're committing a sin of a mission, we're, we're not going accordance to God's will, we're doing our own will, even though it might not seem like we're like directly violating that, um, but just by slightly omitting or just pretending like it's not there, that's, that's the same thing as doing our own plan. Um, so, you know, like Jonah, you know, we could uh, omit preaching to somebody or, or, or something like that. Um, we could omit, um, you know, helping someone in need. Um, just because maybe we think someone else can handle it or we just don't have time for it, right? And it's not maybe that we're really trying to be um, sinful or, or like specifically trying to be mean or um, to someone, but it's just that fact that we just omit that and that's uh, just as bad, right? Anyone else have any other closing comments? I think we're out of time. Go ahead. We see this a lot in, in our world and our own application, right? Well, I'm, I'm just living as a good person. You know, I, even though God says, you know, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, well, God's not going to 
cast me to hell. I don't, I don't cheat on my wife. I don't lie about my taxes. But I don't need to go to church. I'm, I'm just a good person. Right? And so, so often you, you run into people like that who don't feel like they need to congregate and partake of the Lord's Supper and worship and understand God. And you know, they're, they're missing the whole thing. All right. Well, I thank everybody for their comments tonight, and hopefully it wasn't too painful. Uh, so hopefully see you next Sunday.